Hello, this is James Barkell. And it is wonderful to have your company here on the Centre Court. You are listening to the Coach Doctor Podcast. Strikes it beautifully and it's down the middle. In this podcast series, we discuss all things coaching and sports science. Beats one, beats a couple, still going. Each episode will feature prominent coaches on the front line of their sport. Across to Mbappe. As well as some of the world's leading university academics who research what it takes to get the W. All Blacks under big pressure again. If there is an aspect of your coaching that needs some assistance, you can always count on the coach doctor to add life to your program. Browning's having a terrific run. The first three to qualify. You betcha. In this episode, I talk with Dave Diggle. Dave is a veteran of the sporting arena with over 40 years of competitive and hands-on experience at the top level. He represented Great Britain as a gymnast and now works with the next generation of elite performers across a range of both team sports and individual sports, ranging from rugby union to car racing. With a background as a high performance coach, Dave turned his attention to the mental performance and psychological battles that coaches, athletes, and their support networks face in the competitive environment. These days, Dave plies his trade with the Wallabies, Australia's national rugby team, and I was lucky enough to catch up with him before they face his native England in a three test series down under. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, James. Just quickly, tell me where you're coming from at the moment. Uh, look, I'm back in Sydney. Uh, I've been just come back from the UK, funny enough, spent some uh, months over there, but uh, finally back in, in a little bit damp Sydney. Okay, nice. It's very wet, isn't it? I've, I was a bit worried that the uh, storms might might uh, kick in during the interview and affect some of the sound, but hopefully they stay away while we're talking. Yes, I'm sure. I hope so too. <laughs> Hey Dave, tell me a little bit about your background. How did you start working in the area of mental performance? So it's a little bit of an unorthodox entry into this world for me. I started, it goes back to when I was a child. Like So I had a, an accident when I was a, a very young baby and I smashed all the left-hand side of my head. So I have no natural sense of balance because I've got no hearing or nerve endings in my left-hand side. So as a really young kid, I was incredibly accident prone I'd fall over lots and we're talking like, like early 70s so my parents took me to a doctor and they said this is what's going on he's got no natural sense of balance you've got two options you either put him into something to teach him balance or you wrap him up in cotton wool because he's just going to be an accident going somewhere to happen fortunately for me my parents put me into gymnastics to try and teach me some balance and I just thrived in that environment I, I represented Great Britain as a, a junior and senior international gymnast, uh, and I was just absolutely obsessed with, with sport at that age. When I was a gymnast, I was incredibly inconsistent. So I was either doing really, really well, or I just bombed out the bottom. And I thought that was a me thing. I thought that was, you know, I, I wasn't actually that talented, and that's the truth. I wasn't particularly talented. I was more tenacious and talented. So... When I stopped being a competitive athlete and I went into the world of teaching and, and, and sport coaching, and predominantly this was in America, I started seeing the same patterns in not only my athletes, but other people's athletes too. There was this inconsistency. I, I knew that we were all very well trained physically. So back in those days, not so much now, but I had a very fit body and um, I was incredibly well trained. My coach in the UK actually was one of the most successful British coaches of all time. Um, so I knew I had the right kind of technical coaching. So if it wasn't technical and it wasn't physical, then it had to be psychological. So I, I took myself out of high performance coaching at that point, the physical coaching aspect, and re-educated myself in the psychology of performance. And so I guess my drive to get into mental performance came from my own experiences, both as an athlete and as a coach. And it just in, in, intrigued me how much power our mental thoughts, our internal language had over our performance. So that, that, that's my unorthodox entry into the mental coaching world. I studied performance psychology, uh, CBT. I spent a lot of my time spent in uh, learning hypnosis. And there's a, quite a few different stories about how to the depths I've gone and done that and a few other different modalities too. So I, I try and match the right tools to the athlete as I go along. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know about your background in gymnastics and interesting mm. to hear that you had issues with balance and then 
you became so good at a sport like gymnastics, which basically relies so much on balance. So that's really, really interesting to hear. Is it hard to be mentally switched on in performance wise all the time? In yes and no. So being switched on mentally and being engaged. So the, the terminology I use is about being engaged. So that's one of the metrics we have for seeing if somebody is mentally switched on is their engagement. Are they actively communicating? Are they actively problem solving? Are they actively actioning a skill or a request from them? So it's not a have or have not. It's a trained skill. So this, is, this falls under the same banner as mental toughness. Most people think about mental toughness as a have or have not skill set, but it's not. It's a trained skill set. And we, we did a study a few years ago looking at the performance of athletes over a game, a rugby game to, for this conversation, and their whole engagement throughout a, a 80 minute game, how actively engaged were they? And one of the key things that we took away from that was we started to see a set of patterns. So if that athlete was, stay, say, starting slowly, then peaked halfway through a game and then tapered off, we, had, we kept that information, that data, and instead we went back and looked at their training. And it was a direct correlation to how they trained. So in mental engagement is a trained thing. And if we train inconsistently or we train poor at the start of a session, then try and work hard during the, the session itself. And then as we start to see the end of the training session coming, we kind of mentally switch off. We see the same thing on the field of play in games. So it is a, is a learned strategy. And in answer to your question, is it hard? It is incredibly difficult to train because it's not like a physical activity where you see an instant return on investment. Mm -hmm. Mental engagement is it's a fluffy thing around the edges. It's very difficult to uh, quantify to everybody. But you do definitely see when, when you train them to be the second, I talk about going from chalk to chalk. The second you cross a chalk, you want to be switched on. If you're switched on and you're engaged, you're problem solving, you're communicating, you're actively engaged with the, the team dynamic, if you're in a team sport, then they're the metrics we measure. And the more you do that, the stronger that muscle in our mind becomes. Okay, so just thinking of the brain as a muscle, if we're, let's say, holding a bicep curl in that tense position, we can only maintain that for you know, a couple of minutes, uh, depending on the weight. With the brain, is that is that similar in terms of the the pressure or the the in staying engaged? Does that become harder over time? And is it worth? Is it something you do, especially in a game like rugby where there is a lot of stop starts? Is it something that you might think about? Right when the whistle goes, we're on, and when there's a stoppage for a player, an, an injury, or um, waiting for a substitute player or something, have we got time for a you know a, a ten seconds? just relax the brain, give it some rest, and then we then we switch on and become engaged again. Is that something that you think about or is that not something to worry about? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a little bit of a different process we have regarding that. So you talked about the muscle um, bicep curl holding a weight, but if you had a load of diverse exercises, you could maintain that physical activity for much longer. Hmm. And we do the same with the brain. So you're right, if you had to physically stop and stop there and focus on an object your attention span would be quite short i'm sure as a teacher you see this too if you if you don't change a topic then you lose people but if you keep the topics moving over and changing diverse uh, subjects engagement levels then they can stay engaged for a lot longer the analogy i use and it particularly works well here in australia is i talk about fuel as in petrol so if we're talking about them when they're a non-athlete, when they're at home and they're chilling out, I call that their 91 fuel. You know, it goes for a lot longer. It's not particularly good for the engine, but you don't have no high performance requirements out of that. Mm. When we go into what I call student mode, so our training environment, we step that up to a 95. So it burns a little bit cleaner, it's a little bit more focus, but it's a little, it goes a little bit further. Or it doesn't go as far, but it goes far enough to keep you engaged for the whole time. And then you've got your 98, obviously, which is the, the most expensive fuel we can get on the road. That burns even higher, but it's really expensive. So we've got to be really conscious of where we use that. That's going to give you mental and emotional fatigue if you stay there too long. 
Okay. So being able to traverse in and out of those different stages allows you to um, manage those fatigue-based moments. So in, to use your analogy, yes, as, as, a, as a game goes into a, a lull, maybe it's a, you know, if you're going into a, a scrum or a line out and you're not involved in that straight away, you do get that opportunity to step down a couple of layers, get yourselves, get your thoughts together and then refocus. When we're talking about game, we talk about those 91, 95, 98. When we go into game mode or performer mode, as I call that, for me, that's like the F1 high octane fuel. You want to be burning really, really clean. It's really expensive. So you've got to be really conscious of when you're spending that time. So a lot of the players and, and athletes I work with, we go through those different staggered levels of engagement. But as long as they're actively engaged, they can traverse those different stages and different levels quite adequately for the whole period of a, you know, up to a, a 95 minutes, you know, so 85 minutes of a, um, an extended play in a game of rugby for argument's sake. Okay, yeah, I really like that analogy. And in terms of your role as a mental performance coach, do you also look at mental health as well? Or is it specifically aimed at performance improvements on the field? My, my job description is predominantly the, the mental engagement and the physical activity of learning. So that high performance world, as they call it, I mean, I, you, we talked about this the other day, I call it human performance. But if we're talking what most people's terminology is, it's a high performance world. Um, however, when I'm working with an athlete, I work with the athlete, the coach, their parents or their partner. So the environment is really important. And we're a pack animal, so if our environment isn't conducive of that human performance excellence, then we're going to have to look at those kind of mental performance areas as well. Those, are they having trouble at home? Are they away, particularly when we've been in lockdown and on the road for a long period of time? Our mental health becomes a major part of the pieces of the puzzle. So it's, whereas it's not my focus in context of my job description, Absolutely, it's a huge part of the, the puzzle pieces that go, go to make the big picture. And man, managing athletes through those, you know, it's obviously done in conjunction with their doctors, uh, any other health pro professionals that they're already under. Um, when we were traveling before, in, in many different teams, people who have pre-existing mental health challenges. They need to be taken in consideration both in a learning aspect, how they learn, but also a sustainability aspect too. So. How do they stay away from home dealing with the pressures of competition when they've got these already pre-existing challenges already? So that's, that's just part and parcel of the puzzle pieces, I think. Yeah, okay. No, that really makes sense. In terms of your focus on mental performance, do you have different processes for different sports, especially things like contact sports? You're heavily involved in rugby union, for example, compared to the non-contact sports like swimming or gymnastics or something like that? So, again, it's a yes and no response to that because not initially. Initially, my focus is always about the individual athlete. And so even when I'm working in a team environment, my first objective really is to get to know that athlete. So focus on their preparation, their performance strategies, the things that are working in their world, the things that aren't working, and get them to a place where they're thinking about progressing and managing their own environment. And then that goes into the team dynamic. So if I'm working, you, you know, I've been working with the Wallabies now for a while. So working in a rugby union world, my first job is individual athlete. And then when we get into a team environment, it's around the team culture, the team focus. And then how do we integrate that individual athlete's preparation process and performance process and, and plug that into the team dynamic? So initially, no, it's an individual person. So I, my, my philosophy is the best version of you, everybody benefits from. And when we focus on that perspective first and then plug that into the team, as long as everybody's singing the same song and if the team dynamic and their team thoughts are very similar to what I'm trying to do with the athletes, they normally plug and play quite well. One of the things that we're very cognizant of is managing emotion. And when we talk a lot about team dynamics, Team emotion is, is, is a massive part of what motivates a lot of people to be part of a team. It can also be a double-edged sword and, and be able to drag them down too. 
So getting an athlete to be quite self-sufficient and self-aware of their own state of what they want to do, how they want to perform, how they want to be switched on. If a team, and we see this in a lot of team sports, if the team starts to slide down and get into a negative space, having individual athletes who are very aware of their own self status cannot get dragged down that dark hole as well. So if a lot of team players are very aware, you start to see a, a sustainability within a team too. So if they go back to back errors, and there's some key players, maybe the leadership group, positional players where they're really aware that, hey, we can turn this around. And they're very aware of their own self then they become kind of pillars in the team dynamic to kind of drag them back out. On your website, smartmind.com, you've got some links to some other sports that, that you've worked with. And one of them is motorsport, which I find quite interesting as well. Mm. What's the mental preparation like for a race car driver? And again, you sort of answer this question, does it look similar to other sports or is there a specific difference in terms of the requirements for a racing car driver compared to an athlete that might be getting up on the blocks and swimming against another competitor or a golfer who's swinging their, swinging their uh, golf club and, uh, you know, the processes, I guess, that they're going through. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the surface, absolutely, there's some uniquenesses to motorsport. I've worked in motorsport for near on 15 years at multiple different levels. And um, the key thing for me is, is smart decision-making. And if you think you're going around a corner at like 150 miles an hour, the last thing you want to do is think about multiple things that you need to do. So teaching the brain the blueprint of how you go around that corner, the optimal, how you take that corner, where the apex is, when you get back onto the accelerator, all of those kind of things are should be subconscious performance. What we, what we know is our subconscious performs around about 20 times faster than our conscious. So my role really is getting them to trust how they do what they do and then any kind of uniqueness people overtaking them then needed to overtake is the only thing that's going on in their their conscious mind so there's too many things going on one of the exercises um i take a lot of my motorsport people through is what we call flags or technical visualization and that's being able to simplify multiple tasks down to one action it's almost like the domino that sets off the rest of the dominoes in in a sequence and so when you watch a good racing car driver, they can have a conversation to the pit, telling them what's going on with the car, still be hitting or braking at the right place, hitting the right apex, accelerating at the right point, purely and simply because they've one trigger in their brain. Yeah. So is it, is it almost like having the ability to multitask at that elite level going, as you said, 150 miles an hour? Um, and I, I'm just going to go on to one of the videos that you've got on your website is Jake Parsons hanging upside down and it looks like he's going through changing gears. Is this an exercise that you've come up with for him or is this something different? And if so, is it, uh, what's the reasoning behind coming up with this sort of exercise? Yeah. So this is an exercise I've created over the years. It's a pressure test opportunity for an athlete to know that under any kind of circumstances, they can follow the blueprint pattern that we've built inside our head. So with that exercise in specific, specifically with, with Jake, we've built a track map. Now on that track map, there's probably about 150 different things he has to think about every lap, including braking zones, speed, apexes. Um, then you've got wet weather, you've got dry, dry weather uh, options to go through with that as well. So when we invert him and hang him upside down, what that dis disorientates him. It's the same as, you know, if you've ever been scuba diving and you're going down and you sometimes lose where's up and where's down. So your brain gets into a state of survival. And so what I was doing with Jake in that situation, and I do this for a lot of different sports, once they've got a good pattern to follow inside their brain, is we pressure test them. We hang them upside down and get them to visualize their way through their track map. And what you couldn't see on that video, he was telling me, so like corner one, breaking at 20 meters, hit the apex here, I'm in third gear, I now accelerate at this angle, at this speed. So that blueprint that we're talking about trusting is in his subconscious at that point, and he's just going through the motions under very unusual circumstances. So when he does get on the track, somewhere that is comfortable to him, he'll be able to recall that and not feel flustered. Now, that looked, it looked really good and really... Um 
really innovative. And I don't know if it's something that's common in, in race cars, but it, it completely, I guess, being a, a Star Wars fan as a young kid, it, very, it was very Yoda-esque in terms of Luke Skywalker <laughs> hanging upside down, learning to control things with the Force. So that no, was very interesting to see. So thanks for explaining um, the reasoning behind that activity. I'd like, I'd like to say Yoda took it from me, but I'm not quite sure that's true. <laughs> okay. So tell me about your role with the Wallabies. Yeah, so I, I my history with the Wallabies goes back quite a few years. Um, there's been a number of key players that have come and see me individually uh, over the years. You know, started off with um, Lockie Turner many, many years ago, and then Dane Haylett Petty and Matt Tamura and people like that started coming to me individually and, and getting individual coaching on their performance. Um, I spent a bit of time with Michael Checker uh, quite a few years ago, being taken into certain camps and giving him some ideas around communication and team dynamics and learning strategies and skill acquisition too. And then when Dave Rennie came in a few years ago, uh, a lot of the players had mentioned they'd been individually working with me and we had a lot of conversations around me being part of the ongoing program. And I, I guess the reality to what I'm doing now is I'm trying to, I spend about 70% of my time with the individual athletes and the team. So face to face with the players, whether that be bringing up concepts of the whole team dynamic and working with the leadership and the communication model and those kind of things. And obviously individual player preparation. I spend about 20% of my time working with the coaches. So we talk about efficiency and effectiveness in how they deliver their messages, making sure that we're one, empowering the players to take ownership of what they're doing, but also being able to seed the right information in a way that the players take their on board. And I spend about 10% of my time in future development, how we take that all the way down to grassroots level and, and work both with universities and uh, the Super Rugby, so the franchises, all the way up through to the Wallabies. So I think last time we spoke, you also mentioned you were looking at doing some research into that performance level from Wallabies all the way through to grassroots. Could you explain what you're doing there a little bit in a, bit, a little bit more detail? Yeah, this is in its infancy. So um, I, I, I've got to put my hand up here. I'm a nerd. So for me, there has to be some science background behind everything that we do. And um, there's anecdotal things, of course. But for me, I need to see patterns and triggers and what's going on inside the body. Having spent a fair amount of time now with rugby players at all the different levels. So a lot, a lot of young players come to me and say, I want to be a wallaby. And I first need to get into one of our franchises. So that grassroots level. And then I've obviously been working for several years with some of the franchises as a whole team and individuals in that, and obviously Wallabies. There's some, there's some key patterns I'm seeing. So I've got a friend who did some studies in, put, wrote some white papers about the X factor in decision-making. Their expertise is in the field of business. Um, so we've been building probably for the last seven months now, a model where we can go and um, test each level of rugby player and look for those X factor decisions that making the motivators they've got, how they interact with team dynamics. So what we can try and do is plot what makes a successful rugby player. At the moment, we know we've done quite a bit of research. There's no study around the world that's done this. So we're, we're very excited to try and integrate this in and start to look for those X factors. A couple of reasons. One, it allows us to be better in how we train our younger players. So giving them the skill sets that we know they're going to need rather than just the how to pass, how to kick, um, more along the lines of how to think, how to communicate, how to manage themselves, how to prepare themselves, what motivates a key player. So and like if you talk about someone like Hoops, you know, you'd want to be able to uh, emulate that. You want to look at that and say, clearly he's one of the best in the world at what he does. What's he got that we can learn? Mm. So that behavioral profiling. So yeah, we're, we're in the early stages of that. We haven't actually initiated that yet, but we, as I say, we spent the last seven months building the platform to start testing for that. So yeah, hopefully okay. in, in 12 months time, we'll, we'll have a bit of a blueprint of what we can do from club level through to super rugby level through to Wallabies that's gonna make that path a much more easier transition. We do it technically. So if you look at the key Wallaby players, you'll look at what's the skill set that the current world rugby requires and you'll see coaches on a day-to-day -day basis go and implement that in their 
junior programs. Mm -hmm. We do that same with physical. Our SNCs have done a great job in telling us if you want to be a world's best rugby player, these are the physical requirements you're going to need to be. You have to lift this amount of weight, be able to do this kind of speed. So again, you see coaches on a, on a day-to-day level in schools, in clubs, integrating that. We want to be able to do the same from mindset too, be able to teach coaches what they need to do to integrate that into their young athletes. Just going back again with that mindset approach from grassroots through to elite, and you, you, earlier on you mentioned that it's something that you have to work on developing mental toughness and, and um, mental performance. Do people mature at different rates that affect that growth? Is it like some young some young kids are really switched on from a young age and they're really focused and want to be a wallaby or they want to be the next Lionel Messi or they want to be the next um, whoever. But some kids don't really start to think about that or start having that ingrained in or built into them until a lot later. And does that mean those kids who don't have that at that young age are sort of left behind and they're not going to progress to that elite level? So in answer to this, I'm going to show my age. So when I was competing back in the late 70s and early 80s, I think there was a lot more people had primal mental toughness because we had to train, we had to go to school, we had to train, we had to have jobs. So our life was a little bit less orchestrated. And I think we were probably a little bit more self, uh, self-aware, self self-managed. But I don't think our ability to perform at that level was there. So I think what we've done to integrate uh, high performance into the world and those expected uh, physical, technical requirements has allowed us as a, as a sporting um, organization to have a much higher level of high performance. But with that came, I don't think young children were given the tools to be able to think and orchestrate for themselves. You're right, 100% people develop and mature at different ages. There's a very small percentage of people, in in my experience, in my study, that are naturally born with the ability to self-manage. And most people need to get to a stage of either quite a high degree of maturity before they look at it and go, there's more to this than just the physical or the technical. I need to be switched on here. Or more often than not, it's they go through a period where they go, I'm not performing. And they, they go for a period of over preparation. So they'll overtrain, they'll spend more hours kicking or, or, or throwing or doing whatever they need to do and realize that they're getting fatigue based injuries, but their, their performance isn't getting any better. And what I'm trying to do now is to look at so we don't have to go through that period of it being really tough where they they're underperforming because I see we're losing a lot of players because they don't know how to get out of that that place where they're working hard, they're working longer hours, they're kicking more or they're they're passing more, they're getting these injuries, but there's no strategy to get out. So they tip out, they tip out the sport. Um, There is a necessity, I think, to go through some adversity to realise where your boundaries are. I think that's an important part of life. Uh, an incredibly important part of life, particularly high performing. You know, I think that's something you've got to be able to deal with those adversities. But we also need to give them the skill set to be able to manage that. Mm -hmm. So if we can get in earlier and start doing the mental preparation, mental performance, I I ran a a training um, on the weekend, it's just gone. And I worked with a whole bunch of young athletes. Now I'm talking from the age of maybe eight and a half, nine years old and up. And I was teaching them some of these preparation techniques, how to think, how to communicate in a much more simplistic version. But when they walked out, you could hear them talking differently. Now, that was just after a three hour training with me. But what that's already done is it's given the, the, the catalyst to change. And so if we can give these tools to young athletes, they may not necessarily at the time know what gold dust they have in their hands. But when they hit those really challenging times, they've got some tools in the tool belt to go back onto and go, okay, I can do this differently. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go through the next two or three years thinking, am I good enough? I know I'm good enough. I just got to put some different strategies in place. I'm going to go back to your role with the Wallabies. You talked about spending time with the players and time with the coaches. 
So I want to talk a little bit about your time with the coaches. And I, again, I'm going to go back to your website. You've got a course that you run on skill acquisition. When you're talking to coaches, how do you, I guess, look at skill acquisition? Or how does skill acquisition tie in with the mental performance? Yeah, so if we go back to my earlier comment about trying to get the racing car driver to perform subconsciously in that sense of flow, when I'm talking to coaches, we start with the outcome in mind. Okay, what is it you want to get these athletes to do? And then we reverse engineer that process. What do they need to know before that? What do they need to know before that? What do they need to know before that? All the way back to where they are right now. And then I say, right, what is it the one or two key things they need to know to understand that phase? And so my, my role with coaches is not teaching them how to coach because they work with a whole diverse range of athletes in different sports. And other than being a gymnastics coach, every other sport, I'm no specialist in. But what I do try to do is take the, the, the message from the coach and help them to be able to deliver it in a way that the athlete's going to get it. Historically, one of the key things I think that we as coaches do um, that's detrimental is we give them a whole picture. I say, this is how I want you to pass, for argument's sake rather than this is how I need you to stand. This is how I need your body shape to be. Right, we've got that. Now let's look at the, the action. I did an exercise with um, a very prominent wallaby a few years ago. And I went down to Canberra where he was based. And I set up this exercise where he was on the white line in the middle and six feet inside of him were hula hoops. And there were six hoops. And so there was this, this a ball in line with the two hoops, one left, one right, and a ball in line with the next set of hoops, one left, one right. And I said to him, what I want you to do is to walk up to the first ball and pick a side and pass it, but I want the ball to land inside the hoop. And as I say, he was an incredibly prominent rugby player at the time. And he walked up, passed it to the left, and it went just slightly too far. So he went to the next one and he passed it to the right, but it went too shallow. That he went to the next one and he was getting really frustrated. I could see he's getting frustrated. I knew, like I said, he's been a prominent wallaby. He knows how to pass a ball. But what he was doing was overcompensating. So then I got him to do it again, but I got him to do it blindfolded. And interestingly, his success rate was way higher because what he was trusting was that blueprint inside his brain. He wasn't mm -hmm. looking to correct, he was looking to follow through on that blueprint. So in answer to your question, what I try to do with the coaches is get them to embed that blueprint of how in such a way that the athlete gets it. And so I'm working with their language patterns, I'm working with the delivery style, I'm working with breaking it down into bite-sized chunks and then getting to the coach to recognize when that athlete actually gets that technique. Now we can move on. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. It's good again, very, very Yoder-esque in terms of blindfolded <laughs> i do uh, a lot of my exercise blindfolded yeah okay no interesting how do you spend your time with the players in terms of going through their mental skills do you address them in a, in a workshop scenario or is it a lot is there a lot of stuff that you address on field yeah it, it's it's a, a mixture of all of those things so if we're introducing so what i do what's called a seven to two which is a funnel process it's a preparation uh into game day so we we I will present that if we're talking about the Wallabies here, I'll present that to the whole team and say, this is how we effectively prepare for a game and how they build that funnel process is a uniquely thing to them. The key things that are important to them. Then I'll go away and I'll work with them one on one to refine that preparation process specifically for them. And then when we are out on the field, so when, when I was on tour of the Wallabies, you know, I was in every meeting, I was in every training session, and I had individual sessions with them outside of that. But when we were on the field, you'd often see, uh, particularly pass, you know, like lineouts, so the hookers or anybody who's doing kicks will come to me and go, this is what I'm trying to do, this is what's happening, and we'll simplify that process, that blueprint inside their head. Sometimes that's running repairs on the field, Sometimes that's observational stuff. So we'll film them and then we'll go and analyze that and say, okay, what was you thinking here? Does that correlate into your action? And they'll go, yes, it does. Okay, so then we need to refine that. Or does that correlate to your action? No, it doesn't. I thought I was doing this, but my body's doing that. So then we'll go back to, okay, how do we simplify that process to get your body to do what you need it to do? Mm -hmm. 
So there's, there's a very healthy mix of all of those different delivery systems. If I'm looking at efficiency and effectiveness, presenting to the whole team just seeds a concept. Working that one-on-one -on -one allows them to put some framework around that. And then when I'm on the field and they're applying what we've been building, that allows them to master and own that. Mm -hmm. so, so that's my natural progressing through that process. And is it built into the team process throughout the week, such as the, the, the strength and conditioning, the, the, the on-field training, and are the coaches, is there a certain language that, that you, I guess, want the coaches to use to promote or to reinforce a lot of your ideas? So yes, the, the first part of that question it is fairly well integrated throughout the week, and we're still refining that. Uh, as, a, as a coaching group, we're still refining the, the effectiveness and efficiency of how we do that. And hopefully that will always be the case. It will keep refining and growing that process. Um, when we think about the um, in individual athlete and what they're, what they're doing, what I, I try to do with them is spend a lot of individual time. So we'll go in, we'll, we'll do what's called a what worked, what didn't work, what do we do different process, a debrief process after every training session. And I'll go, okay, in your training session, what worked well today? What didn't work? So I'm very specific with my language and I pass that on to the coaches and you start to hear, particularly at the, the elite level now, they'll start to say, okay, what's working? And the athlete will go, but I didn't do this. And they'll go, yeah, but what was working? Because we want to shift the way that the brain sees the skill. We want to see what we need to replicate first, what's working, and then what's not working. And then we come to solution-based focusing. There's three kinds of uh, communication style that we tend to see with coaches and with players. And one of the trainings I took through the whole Wallabies team through last year was on communication models. The first one is what we call graveyard, which is where no one says anything. And then when somebody does say something, it frightens the life out of you because you don't know who said it, where it came from. And in a game scenario, we see this a lot where people who don't normally speak up all of a sudden speak and people go into a process. I've never heard them ask for that or direct me to do this so they they lose focus on the game and then be more focused on who the hell said that the second one is where we see most coaches live and that's machine gunner where they just keep the of information and hoping that something hits what we've become very focused on and one of the key things i think from a communication model that's paramount is we want to be snipers we want to be very clear what we want to say and we only want to say it once. So we've got to be very clear. How do we deliver that? And, and it's been a, an education process for all coaches that I work with and something we've been very focused on in, in, in the Wallabies is how do we become sniper communicators? I, I spent a lot of time working with our leadership group too on how do you deliver your, med, your message? How do you do that in a way that everybody knows when you say this, this is what the action is? And it gets the players to think about their messaging too, not just machine gunning, but being snipers. Okay, yeah, I really like that idea of the, the sniper over the machine gunner in terms of the the communication and the, the feedback style. It's That's really, really good. I like, I really like that uh, analogy. You mentioned before that you analyze or you, you can try and measure the, I guess, the mental performance. So we often analyze performance in, testing for like skin folds, VO2 max, and those sorts of things in, in terms of athletic performance. We measure tactical elements of the game when we're coding your things like missed tackles or tackles made versus tackles missed. So how do you go about analysing mental performance? Because I guess a lot of it would be very uh, qualitative in, in terms of it's the way you, the way you go about it. Uh, yeah, and this feeds back to what we were saying before about mental engagement. And so when I'm watching a game, one of the key things I'm looking for is body language. Are they engaged? Are they active? Are they communicative? All of those key things, are they problem solving? Are they you know, engaged with the team in the huddle? Or are they looking at the scoreboard or are they looking away? So these key areas allow me to know they're mentally engaged. They're, they're mentally problem solving. Communication is a massive one. We tend to see most people go in their shell and they'll stop communicating. For me, then once they go in there, they're not mentally engaged. They're internally focused, they're internally processing. When, when you see a really good player or particularly a good leader, 
during tough times, they're the ones that communicate the best because they're engaged in what they're doing. So we measure that. Body language is a massive one. And one of the key things I've said to a lot of the rugby players is when you, when you are tired, and there's no doubt that you're tired, the second you're bent over, you're looking at the ground, two messages are happening. One to yourself, that I'm tired, I don't know if I can go through with this, but also to your opponents, again, we've got them. So body language allows us to know that they're thinking about staying engaged. You know, they're pushing through those tough physical times or even tough scoreboard times where they go, no, I've not, I'm not going to give up on this. I'm engaged in this. I'm solution orientated. I'm looking for a, a way that we get out and get back in front. So they're the key things that I measure. And I go back to that earlier study that we looked at where they starting slow, peaking and then dropping off. What that ended up in, in their mental toughness, in their training this is where we start to see teams that will score and then concede, score and then concede. And that's them switching off. And that's a great indicator that not only individuals have switched off, but the whole team has switched off. If, can you give me an example of how you can develop that ability to not switch off or that ability to, to create more longevity in your mental toughness or mental performance? Yeah, I mean, like, how do you eat an elephant? No idea. A chunk at a time, otherwise you choke. Yeah. So okay. I, I, I use the same <laughs> analogy of compartmentalization throughout an 80 minute game. Um, so if, I, if I'm talking to a rugby player for argument's sake and they'll, they'll talk about halves, I'll talk about either five or 10 minute blocks. So it allows you to be almost regenerated after the first five or 10 minutes and then go, right, what's my next focal point? So it might be you know, often they'll talk about coming out and starting hard or being engaged in a game. So if that's your first block, what do you need to do to make that happen? Once that's happened, what's your next block? And it could be communication. It could be, you know, uh, create an opportunity. It doesn't really matter what their individual focus is, but we break it down into bite-sized chunks. I worked with a ultra marathon runner a few years ago. And we looked at that whole period of time that they were running. It was a hundred mile run. And they said, I said, what do you think about? They said, oh, I switch off. I just, I just run. And I said, okay, so what do you notice when you're running? And they said, oh, I only switch back on when something goes wrong. And it's the same analogy when we look at players, when they switch off, they only normally switch back in again when something goes wrong or they make a mistake, they drop a high ball or they, or they miss a pass. And then they're kind of re-engaging because it's, it's, it's a consequence. But if we break it down into those bite-sized chunks, then every period of time, let's say whether it be five or 10 minutes in the rugby game, with this runner, it was every 20 minutes, we had a different focus, which allowed them to stay engaged. They could focus for 20 minutes. Rugby players, if they can focus for five minutes and then go, right, tick, got that, onto the next one. It allows them to stay engaged for much longer. And that's a training process. They'll get better and better and better at that. Dave, a lot of coaches will give a message to their players. It's, you know, it's the first five minutes. You know, we win this game in the first five minutes. What happens if, you, if a coach gives that message and the first five minutes, everything goes wrong and the team sort of crumbles for the rest of the game? Is, is that a bad message to be giving teams? Or what, what do you think? Uh, interesting you say that. I've had this conversation with coaches on multiple different levels in multiple different sports um, in, in setting up an expectation like that. So in answer to your, uh, your question, is it a bad message? I believe so, yes. So we, we, when we're preparing for a game, we, as I say, we break it down into each section. So when I'm play, we're talking with players, it's five, 10 minutes. When I'm talking to coaches, it might be every 15 minutes. And making sure that what the the coach's messaging for the whole collective team is this is our focus. We want to come out strong. We want to dominate this. We want to see what we want to do in the first 15 minutes. Then we want to do this, which is going to do that. It's going to do this and go through the whole process. In my final process, my seven to two, the whole concept of this is when you get to the day before a game, you can look at it and go, do I feel ready? Now, most athletes will say, no, I want to go and do some more kicking. I want to do some more passing. I don't feel particularly confident yet but that process will allow them to go I know I'm ready I've broken it down now I can tick boxes but then I say to me okay if you've got this funnel for seven to two into your preparation but all of a sudden you can't train on one day and you've got a big red cross what does that mean 
And then most athletes will turn around and they'll say, that means I'm not ready. I'll say, no, it doesn't. But because you know that the two days before that, the two days after that, you ticked all your boxes, you know you can manage that. And it's the same with a game. If you broke a game down into bite-sized chunks, and one of those chunks, are you go out there, we want, to, we want to dominate them, and all of a sudden they're dominating you. Okay, guys, next task, next job. What is it? And it allows them to focus on the next job rather than think, I've got to play catch up. I've got to fix that first 10 minutes. And unless anybody's got a time machine, I've not known yet how we can go back in time and redo it. So it is about moving on to the next job. And that's definitely part of how we structure the communication model to these players. Just on the back of talking about emotion, my role is to get players to think in pragmatic process. If you go into a stadium and there's 50,000 people looking at your emotions are going to be up, doesn't matter who you are. So what I need to do is get them to think more process orientated. If the emotions go up, it's like a seesaw, if the emotions go up, normally the logic goes down. And that's where we make mistake after mistake after mistake because we're trying to emotionally fix it by overworking or overdoing or overplaying. So I, I get players to go, when, when the emotions go up, what I want you to think, what's my next process? How do I systematically go through the next bit? So it, it gets some more e equality into what they're doing and an equilibrium into what they're doing and allow them to do that kind of process of, yep, break this down. That didn't work. Flush that. Move on. There's a, there's a technique I take a lot of performers through, and that is when you go into performer mode, all you're doing is executing what you know. And in reality, game day or competition day should be the easiest thing you do all week. All the hard work needs to be done during the week. So when you go out there and you're executing, if you make a mistake, that's not the time to go and think about it and correct it. That's the time to move on to the next thing and execute that your best. So having that identity around student versus performer and allowing them that when you come off the, out the game, we'll analyze what didn't work, we'll put it right. But in the game, that's not the time to go and force a shift or a change in, in what you've done. And how about after a game when you have a either a, a really good win or a really bad loss where maybe the teams perform really badly? How do you go about reviewing that? Is, it, is mental performance part of that review process? And a lot of the times, obviously, again, if you've had a big win the following week, is it hard to maintain that same, I guess, standard compared to, you know, if you've scraped through or you, 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 you're working really hard to, to get to that level? Is that something that, that you guys think about? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll answer that in, in reverse. And if you go into a game and you're highly emotive and you, you win, there's a huge amount of high emotional expectation to get to that same emotional standard next week. And in athletes, we see there's normally more of a fear of success than there is a fear of failure. And I'll, I'll explain that. If we're thinking about most people in their life, that no one wants to fail, because that means you're at the back of the pack. Athletes spend every day getting things wrong and trying to correct them. So the fear of getting things wrong necessarily isn't a huge fear to them. Because they know that, yeah, I did this yesterday, I messed up my line out, I can fix it today. But the fear of success can sometimes be even more scary to them because they, we've just raised expectation. So if you go out and you have a big win and you don't know how you did it, in that your brain going, oh, I've got to do that again next week. I don't know how. So not, not bouncing off of emotion, but trusting process allows you to go, we've had a great win this week. Right, I could just need to press go and do that exactly the same thing again next week. Hit those same metrics, break it down in the same way, same level of engagement. You're less fearful of it not being able to be replicated. If it's an emotional sugar hit, then you know that's when we start seeing people get really, really emotional, hoping it's going to be the same. But that's a really bad roller coaster. So that that side of it for me is is more replicable. You're more likely to be able to replicate that success that next week if you have a, a game that doesn't go your way and you're analytically understanding that we went out we went this was our strategy but in hindsight that was a wrong strategy so then you've got pragmatics to fix 
it's not an emotional, am I good enough or am I not good enough? It's okay, we made the wrong call. That's okay, we'll learn from that, we'll build forward. We'll make sure that next week when we go out, we don't make that same mistake, we'll make an adjustment. But again, if you, you just build people up emotionally and then say, right, go out there and just rip into them and just do your best, guys, and then they perform poorly, the first thing goes, I'm not good enough. I wasn't good enough to go out there and rip into them. So it, it actually takes away our ability to create replicability in process and in performance. The other thing, the process I take them all through is what we call a mental huddle. So uh, one of my trainings is taking an athlete individually through, if you look at your preparation, what worked, what didn't work, what do we do different? And then you go to game day and go, okay, in game day, what worked, what didn't work, what do we do different? And you marry your preparation and that game and go, right, next week, these are the areas I'm going to replicate, these are the areas I'm going to fix, and this is how I'm going to do that. I, working in teams, an a, a area that I'm trying to integrate, <coughs> excuse me, integrate more frequently is how we do that in a team dynamic. So if we look at it pragmatically, you've got individual athletes going through their individual uh, assessment, their mind huddle of how they did what they did. Then they might go through positional groups. So the forwards might sit and go, okay, as a forwards group, what worked for us in our preparation this week? What didn't work? What do we need to do different? What worked for us in a game this week? What didn't work? What do we need to do different? The centers will do the same. The backs will do their same. Then you kind of bring all of those positional information to the team meeting. The team meeting takes that to the leadership group and the coaches that then feeds into next week. So you, you're, you're performing off data in from positional areas, not just win or lose. Okay, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think there's, you know, especially for coaches in the that sub elite sort of level, there's a lot of interesting things that they can take out of those comments and try and implement in their in their coaching as well. So thanks for that. How do you how important do you think a mindset coach is to a team's performance? And obviously at that elite level, it's happening a lot, but what about at all levels? Is there something that coaches can do at all levels to increase that mindset um, coaching? Yeah, look, the analogy I use with all coaches is it's like an F1 car. If we put all our money and our time and our expertise into building the vehicle, but we don't have a driver, then we just got a really expensive paperweight. Doesn't matter how good it performs, it's not going to go out there and perform. So... I think having a, a mindset coach inside every organization, of course, I'm going to say this, I think is paramount because historically, when you look at preparation of athletes, almost all the focus is on physical and technical. And then they don't understand why they, the athlete can't take that physical and technical preparation and transfer it into a game. Under pressure, all humans revert back to familiarity. So what we want to do is create a familiar performance stri uh, strategy and cycle for that athlete. So get in inside the head, get inside the driver, if you like, inside that vehicle is super important. If we look at the younger, um, I, I, I wrote some children's books about 20 years ago and I, I wrote 22 of them and they were language based driven books, which is a little bit strange if you think about it from what I do for a living. But my whole concept was to shift the way that these children think in an early stage and give them, set them up for success rather than try and fix them when they're high adults or high teens, early adults, and go, we could have fixed this years and years ago. So I see getting involved with grassroots performers of all stages as a, an immunization against potential future crashes and being, getting athletes to speak in articulate ways, in the, being those snipers, being able to analyze their performance where they know that they made a technical mistake rather than I'm not good enough at grassroots levels, allows us when we do get to that high end performance level of that all they're focusing on is application of their skill set. If I'm having to work with them on their I'm not good enough so at that stage, then we're already hamstrung. Dave, do you mind telling me what those books are? 
Yeah, so it's <laughs> a, a series of books, uh, uh, Enjoy the Ride and, and, and Ride the Wave. Yeah. And um, people can go and search them out on Amazon. They're a good 20 years old now, but they're just really simple for three to six year old bracket and the design for mum and dad to read to the kids. And it's very focused on delivery of empowerment of language. If we think about the way that we speak, the, the analogy I use all the time is if I had an iPad and I had a Galaxy tablet, but I tried to download the iOS onto my Galaxy, would it work? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no, even though most of the components inside are exactly the same. In actual fact, I know for a fact that most of them are built in the same factories and they're just put in the, in the um, Galaxy in a different way. So our language patterns are our iOS operating system. We've got to make sure that it's efficient, it's effective, and it's relevant to us. Then you okay. can go out there and you can upgrade that as you go through life. But the reality is it's an operating system that works for you. Okay. No, I'm definitely going to have a search for some of those books, mate. That sounds interesting. Hey, Dave, last question, because I've, I've already had you for about an hour of your time, and I know you've got plenty to do. So... Lastly, on your website, smartmind.com, you've got a number of courses and programs that are available to, I guess, anyone. Who are these courses aimed at? Are they aimed specifically at elite athletes? Are they aimed at basically anyone or young people looking who, who want to maybe be elite one day? So, yeah, we've got a, a bunch of videos that deal with a whole series of, of normal challenges that most elite athletes face. So who are they for? They're for the people that are not quite yet at that level, but they want to break through. And they're, but they're finding some resistance to some kind of learning, whether it's like performance anxiety or whether it's mental blocks or anything like that. These videos are designed for them to watch, go through and learn some strategies. Uh, often getting the opportunity to work with somebody like myself one on one can be challenging, both time wise and financially for some young athletes. So these mental deep dive videos are for people to kind of, that's their first step. Let me go and see if I can solve this myself and go through these videos, get some of the strategies. They'll give them opportunity to maybe realize why they're having the issues, which is sometimes a massive step forward for them. And they realize, okay, this is normal. I'm not broken. I'm actually just being human. So I, there are strategies for me to move past this. So the, the, the training video library, we're, we're constantly adding to that. In actual fact, I've just spent two months recording a whole six new episodes to go in there, different topics. So they'll be dropped in over the next couple of months. Uh, another course that we, we run is the Mental Gladiator. This is something that um, I've done face to face over many years. And it's over a, over a month or a 30 day period we take athletes who would normally turn around and go, I'm really nervous. I don't know if I want to perform on the weekend. I don't want to go out there. I love doing my sport. I love training. But come come game day, I'm really scared. And I teach them a set of 16 strategies over a course of 30 days, how to go from dreading to perform to loving how to perform. And so the, the mental gladiators, just that what I've always done face to face, we're now going to start doing those online because hey, COVID has mean most of us have to learn online and uh, I'm not traveling the world like I was doing. Um, so yeah, th these are just courses that allow young athletes who want to be at the high end of their sports, but are just finding some of the challenges in getting past of the normal things that everybody goes through and not really having access to find out how do I navigate those things. Okay, thanks for that, Dave. So Dave, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for giving up an hour of your time and mate, all the best of luck to you and the Wallabies. I know you've got England coming up later this year and obviously judging by your background, you might have a second thoughts about wanting the Wallabies to win that that, that test series, but, no, not <laughs> <true>. <laughs> but mate, um, all the best for that. And I hope you guys do really, really well. Thank you very much. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me on your show. I have to say I really enjoyed this chat as I do all of my chats but there were some aspects of this one that really brought up some memories of my childhood watching movies like Star Wars where Yoda trains Luke Skywalker in the Jedi arts by overloading his mind having him upside down using the force to move multiple objects and martial arts movies like Bloodsport where Jean-Claude Van Damme playing the character of Frank Dukes 
is blindfolded while training to simplify his thought processes and focus his energy. Basically, Dave uses similar ideas for what seems to be similar reasoning. So I found that extraordinary. I also really like Dave's simple use of analogies to explain sometimes complex theories. After spending some years researching coaching behaviors, I have learned that the use of analogies can be a very powerful tool for athlete understanding. But never have I heard such well-constructed analogies used so regularly that were also so effective in their messaging. I would presume Dave structures a lot of his work around analogies for this exact reason. Specifically, I really like the ideas of coaches being either machine gunners or snipers, and the idea that we all really want to be a sniper that is accurate and succinct with messages rather than machine gunners who waffle and take time to get the message across or send out too many messages in one instruction. I also really like the way Dave was able to connect the idea of mental training with skill acquisition development. This was the first time I heard how the two areas of performance were symbiotic. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did and took as much away from it as I did. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to share it on your social media pages and share it with your friends and colleagues. If you would like to get in touch with Dave Diggle, you can find all his contact details on smartmind.com. I'll have a link to this on my show notes. I suggest checking out the video of Jake Parsons hanging upside down in his driver's suit and helmet while he's changing gears. Till the next time, keep learning.